Grand Rising Soul Family. Adam Jackson here with another episode of the Sacred Sons podcast. Sacred Sons, today we have a powerful and inspiring guest by the name of Teal Swan. So looking forward to drop in on topics of resiliency, leadership, and just what is going on in our world, how we're going to meet it, how we're going to face it. And Sacred Sons, if you are interested in diving into your own masculine alchemy, Sacred Sons has events happening all over the globe. Our European tour just started this weekend in Ireland. We're coming to Scotland, Portugal, EMX. I will see you there. We have events on the West Coast happening all of the time and Convergence 7 in October. Convergence 7 Generations will be in North Carolina. If you are interested, please go to sacredsons.com and sign up for an experience today. <clears throat> all right. And with that, our guest today, she's a spiritual leader. She's an international speaker and best-selling author of the novel, Hunger of the Pine. She's also a mother to a sacred son. And Teal is on a mission to help people who have experienced suffering and trauma take charge of their own healing, <clears throat> take charge of their own healing process and to live empowered and unapologetic lives. Please welcome Teal Swan. So let's get right into it. I wanna invite us to take a deep breath for ourselves. Scanning the body, tuning in to what feels alive and teal on this beautiful day. What is most alive within you? The recognition that I have a blind spot when it comes to whether people want truth or not. Mm. Let's let's say more. And and what happens when you do tell the truth? I get slaughtered publicly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I, and so I'm, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, this is a time for resilient leadership. Yep. And I want you to know from me to you that I see you as a resilient person, uh, knowing a little of your, your history and what brought you into this work, but even with what's going on now, to see you stand in your resilience, to feel you, you know, and it's not like, it's not like it's a, a they thing, but you know, this is really happening and betrayal really happens. And so what does it, what does it mean to you to be a resilient leader at this time? I'm not losing sight of what you stand for and who you stand for. It's actually been a, a big part of what I feel like my life and experience for the last few months is especially centered around because when you're personally tested, it's really tempting to get self-centered and you only think about your own personal best interest. And, you know, in my case for the last two months, that's been wanting to hide in a cave somewhere. Right. Yeah. But, but it's like, by doing that, you have to see if you're in this leadership position that you're essentially abandoning all the people you represent. So for me, a big part of resilient leadership is not allowing yourself to succumb to just your own personal experience. Mm. And essentially, you know, stepping up and doing the right thing for a large group of people rather than just the self. Beautiful. Adam checking in. You know, I want to build on that and say, you know, when when political and institutional leadership is failing us, we we need it, we tend to look towards spiritual leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like this is a time where people are having a a difficulty in knowing who to trust, knowing who's actually telling them the truth. You know what I mean? And so, you know, it's cancer season and, <laughs> you know, I'm in my little crabby shell too. I got my little pinchers out too. You know what I mean? And my, you know, for my check-in, I, I, I have a lot of frustration. Yeah. This is, this is in my human design. This is my not self. It's like when I'm in frustration, I'm in my not self. And there's so much to be frustrated about in this world. And with that, there's also an opportunity for resilient leadership to shine through. 
And so thank you for coming out of the cave. I'm going to come out of my shell today and we'll drop in. You know, I wanted to ask you specifically because you're a mother, but also because of this leadership, when you see more and more human rights being taken away, when you see Roe versus Wade being overturned, yes, the frustration is there. I'm sure the anger was there for you. Um, but, but beyond that, what do you believe is the greater shift that is happening on our planet right now? The greater shift that's happening on our planet, specifically with humanity, is a shift away from a, a narcissistic way of being. When I use the word narcissism, um, I use it in a very specific way. The state of narcissism is the state of only caring about one's own best interest. It creates like this bubble reality made for one. If I was to sum up the biggest issue that all people struggle with, it is this, this failure to be able to take the other and the self at the same time. And the more that a, a person perceives themselves to be in pain or threatened, the more into this narcissistic bubble they go. But that's a, a very dangerous dance. And we've been doing that with each other forever. And we're not just doing that with each other. Humanity's doing that with everything else on this earth. Yeah. It's, well, I'm going to do what's in my best interest, regardless of the impact on anybody else. And no matter if it's good for you or not, you can only play a zero sum game in a closed system for so long before you've killed the very thing your life depends on. And that's where humanity is headed right now. So that's this exactly larger shift, yeah. yeah. So this larger shift is, is out of narcissistic mentality. It's, it's into a space of love. You know, and I, I really love when, when we talk about that, because that word has been so overused throughout history that it's like lost its meaning for people right it's like you say oh we need to live from love and it's like even i'm like oh god you know but that's because we don't understand how incredibly radical the practice of love is we don't understand how difficult it is yeah because love just loves love doesn't have an agenda love uh love is everlasting but it's also a in a in a state of long-term thinking but so specifically around like body autonomy in our health mm. you know what does it mean for the collective and I, I, you know we don't have to go into it like that but because <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to i don't want to get too deep into it but like what what is, what would your message be for me as a man okay how in in i, I guess I, I would just say it like this no, you can, you can, I mean, you can, you can, I don't have a problem going directly at subjects if you do. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Just, so let me ask it like this. That, this, this look on my face is just like, oh, we're going there, aren't we? Okay. Yeah. It's 8 a.m. Where, where you are. So we're, we're just going in. I'll just, I'll say it. How does this push to remove women's body autonomy and choice? You know, what does this mean for us? And, and, why I'm asking that is because, you know, I have, um, yeah, what does this mean for us? It means a great many things, but the, the two things that I want people to understand that it means the most is number one, a loss of body sovereignty. I think that the big mistake that people are making right now is that this is going to be just about women. This is the first push to make it so that government right. organizations can control body sovereignty for all humans. And, and that, that can get so scary. <laughs> I mean, so scary. We were kind of traipsing there with the COVID crisis, you know? Yes. So it's like we're, we're watching these institutions sort of flirt with this idea of taking away a person's right to their own physicality. And I'm watching that. And, and that means a hell of a lot. And of course, my, my eyes are on, it is terrifying the way that we treat women in the world, you know? Yes. I think it's terrifying the way we treat men too. But I mean, right now we could make this entire conversation about you know, feminine rights and femininity and the crisis around women. But this is going somewhere far more dangerous, I'm afraid. Mm. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is we're heading in the direction of these institutions or society itself, we could say, treating an individual human as a commodity, almost treating a human like livestock. Now, right. I'm a vegan. I don't believe in doing that with animals. I don't believe in doing that with anything but a it's a little bit it's a little bit like a bad sci-fi movie when we start to treat a human entity as if it is a commodity and we're headed there as well yeah and and i i also i also see this push to remove uh kind of like the the identity from women and into oh, yeah. like 
it's it's almost like it's it's disrespectful to the womb. <laughs> you know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, and so oh. so so the the silver lining that I see because I'm always looking for it. That's just the type of human that I am. When I see things like formula shortages being pumped by the media, I go, well, great. This is an opportunity to normalize breastfeeding. When I see people talking about Roe versus Wade being overturned, I say, good, this is a time to deepen into midwifery and medicine work. Yes. Because there are other ways that are more human than what we've been sold. Oh, totally. You're going to, you're about to see a fertility crisis too in the world. I mean, it's already started. I've been talking about this for for a lot of years, but it's about to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And and talking about turning a, a human being into a commodity, the response to this that's going to come largely out of the um, sort of Asian technology being developed right now is this push to take even gestation away from women. So yes. it'll be it'll be machines that are essentially you know taking over that process of fertilizing and gestating babies. Yeah, there's a conversation that happens. I have three sons. Uh, my youngest is just six months, so I'm really in it, you know, and um, there's a conversation that happens like, how did you get pregnant? Like, what, yeah. do you mean? what do you mean? It's like, well, did you do this or did you do that? It's like, no, no, we are humans and you know how we got pregnant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That That's a scary question for me to hear from just like the average person. Yeah. Because what that means is that we're going further and further away from nature. Oh, totally. Further and further away from ourselves. Totally. Yeah. Well, what they say is you have to lose yourself to find yourself, right? And that's kind of the, the problem with the state of narcissism is you become this closed bubble that's essentially disconnected from the rest of the system. So it's like, how far does that have to go before you're like, wait, wait, that doesn't work for me, you know? Right. And that's kind of the question that most of us who are, who are on this path of awakening, on top of being on top of our own patterns, most of what we're doing is looking out into the world being like, how bad does it have to get, honestly, for the average person to decide this isn't working and I need to go back towards my true self, back towards what is healthy for me as a, as a biological organism on earth, you know? Yeah. And so I, I listened to your 2022 predictions at the beginning of this year. Um, yeah. You tend to be spot on. It's one of the reasons why I'm uh, a fan of yours because of these predictions. And before we go into like what's going to happen the second half of this year, but I, I'm curious, where does your channel come from? How do you source uh, the things that you see, the things that you call and, and just kind of like, you know, is there some type of a, a guidance for you to, to bring through uh, these predictions? What it is, is that when you have this practice of radical integration, you're essentially taking all things as a part of the self. And that makes it so your own perspective becomes more and more and more and more objective. You're essentially, it's, it's almost like, have you ever seen like a cell take on other cells? Yes. Okay, it's kind of like that. When you do that with everything in existence and that's your practice, all of a sudden your own perspective starts to go till all of a sudden it's large enough that you have like this objective vision of, of whatever you're looking at, whether it's humanity or earth or you know, whatever. I can't say that anybody in existence is exempt from what you don't know that you don't know, but I, I will tell you that my own practice and my own awakening has definitely made it so that I have more of an objective vision than most people. This includes the capacity to disidentify from my own individual self. And that enables for a lot of out of body travel where you start to see perspectives that you definitely can't see when you're you know, sort of identified and embodied, things like that. But that's how the majority of my information is coming through. When I do those, those yearly predictions, <clears throat> most of the time what I'm doing is going out of body and I'm, obser I'm observing human consciousness as if it was one solid entity. Mm. And I'm predicting patterns based on what I'm watching the same way that you would for a friend in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And so a, a large part of the prediction was that people are going to be pushed to their breaking points. This is also a process that's been happening. Uh, for for several years, um, but what I what I really took out of there is that it's time to return to simplicity. It's time to um, stop with all the the charades and festivities and just come back to what's meaningful and what's important. So, just for the people who are listening who may not have heard it, how can simplifying our lives help help to anchor us during this time? Well, the first thing to understand is when people are pushed towards a breaking point, 
there's this massive overwhelm and, and that overwhelm registers in the system as an intense pressure. So if you're starting to simplify your life, you're decreasing that pressure. But what's interesting is that you know, simplifying, people love to think they know what simplifying means because we like, to, we like to project our own version of what simplicity is on other people, but it's gonna look different from person to person because what we're really needing to do is to simplify based on our core values. So one, one's person's you know, core values may be returning to nature and therefore it's pretty explanatory what simplifying would look like in their life. For another person, maybe I really, I really love financial success. That's my absolute value. And so simplifying looks like prioritizing more towards that and essentially cutting off these extraneous things in their life to, to a certain degree. Um, so I'm, there's, they're almost, especially in the spiritual field, needs to be a little bit of a removal of this judgment that part of what simplifying is, is, is like no more buying things or whatever, you know, that could be an element of, of simplifying or it could not. It depends on the person. The most important thing is that we hone in on exactly what our top values are yeah. and we prioritize and live our lives according to that. And when we do that, it provides immense meaning for the system. Whenever you're living according to your values, you're going to register in your, in your being as if you're, the life you are living is right. The life that you were living has meaning and there is purpose for you doing what you are doing. And that adds a lot of energy to the system, like a lot. It makes it so that we are a lot more resilient to these oppositional forces that are coming at us. And if we're living according to our value, that acts a little bit like a buoy, where if we get hit by these storm waves, which is really honestly what all of us are going through, it's like we're in this like intense storm in the middle of the ocean. And if we're just like able to hold on to this thing that really does matter to us yes, and commit our energy and focus to it, then it creates a kind of centeredness in that storm. And so I did this recently. I, I created the four pillars of my life is what I called it. I actually did it two years ago on my 40th birthday. I feel like this, this time of 40 is a foundational, like it's time to have your foundation set by the time I'm 40. That, this is my personal belief. And, and so my foundations are family, land stewardship, sacred brotherhood, and my physical temple. Because awesome. it's, it's time for that as well. So I'm curious, what would you say are the, are the pillars or the standards of your life? Wow, no pressure. Having no time to think about this. Um, my top pillar would be excellence. Mm. I am totally dedicated to that as my absolute top value. Um, wow. And that means in anything that I do. I want to strive to be the very best that I can be at all moments relative to anything I put my energy into. Uh, second thing would be around truth, truth, authenticity, honesty. It's all in the same vein. Yes. I very much recognize that that is something which <clears throat> has always been a, a very important thing in my life. And I want to continue to stand for it regardless of whether or not people who speak the truth get crucified. Um, third. Which is also, which is always the case throughout history, truly. Mm -hmm. Third would be mastery. And fourth would be health. And when I say health, I mean spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. Yeah. Health at all of these levels so that they come into a state of alignment, almost like a, a braid, you know, a braid where you've got health running through all of those strands. Those would be my four pillars. See, now when we have this discussion around these, these pillars or these top values, if you're living according to them, or if I'm living according to them, even if life gets really crappy, meaning there is going to be contrast with anything you commit yourself to. And I don't think people understand that enough. So if there's contrast, meaning the unwanted with everything you're going to commit yourself to, you're going to end up with an attitude of, well, it, even if it gets crappy, there's nothing else for me. In my heart, there's nothing else for me. And that a great deal of pain for the physical human comes from looking out the window at, <laughs> oh, the going got hard and like, oh, oh, man, I could be living that life. I could be doing that thing. I could be avoiding this thing. And when you're living according to your values, that doesn't occur. It, it literally yes. starts to feel like there's just nothing else for you. It's a yes, this is my life, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. And I found that people ask me like, Oh, have you seen this show or have you done like, have you gone to this event? And I'm like, between my family and sacred sons, I have very little time <laughs> to dedicate to like really diving into something like that, you know? And I, and it, I'm like, I'm a nerd too. Like if game of Thrones, I'm going to watch the new season of game of Thrones. Don't get me wrong. However, I'm not like seeking out things to fill my time because yeah. I'm so dedicated and on mission that like what you're saying, even through COVID uh, in, in kind of building sacred sons, we had to make serious choices. Like, no, we're still going to gather. No, we're still going to meet. We're still going to do the work because this is what we believe in. Yeah. And, and, and this is the way that we have to meet life, especially in this time. And so, yeah, honesty. Yes. Honesty in terms of, in terms of the work we do with men, mm -hmm. uh, we have agreements that we make when we step into our containers. Nice. Uh, the first agreement is confidentiality. The second agreement is honesty. So now that we know we're in a confidential space, we can be honest. So mm -hmm. can you um, kind of talk about the radical healing power of honesty? When I hear that, when I hear the words, the radical healing power of honesty, the first place that I go to is that unless you admit to where you are, there is no healing that can be done. Because yeah. healing is really to start at like point A, which is the unwanted state, and then to look at to the opposite side of that, what is point B, which is the wanted state, and how do I close that gap? But if you're unable to be truly honest, then that means you have no point A. Yeah. So like, what, what are you going to do for your life? Run around sort of like chasing turkeys? I, <laughs> you know, honesty puts you in this place of like, all right, this is the reality. And the reality is your only access for power. And while this is important for any human living on earth it is especially important for for men to come to this place of of like radically being inside reality and then taking action based on reality yes you know action being another element that's so incredibly essential for for men <sighs> yeah that's what comes to mind i mean <laughs> yeah and so let let's talk about men how can we as men show up in these times. And I'm saying this because there's a movement of, of conscious and embodied men mm -hmm. who, who, who look at what's happening and go, no, that's not it. And I want to desperately show up in, in, in a better way, let's say. And there's also this, this kind of view on men, like, like uh, almost just like men are, men are shit. Like men will fuck up, men will cheat, men will lie. And there is also truth to that. And we look at, we look at the state that we're in with men in power. And we see what this does when, when the, the feminine energy is missing in our leadership. So how can we, and you're speaking These to thousands of sacred power. sons. These men are not in power. Okay. Something that I'm wanting people <clears throat> to understand. I want to go here with you because obviously you do what you do and yeah. I have such an unpopular opinion when it comes Bring to it. Bring all it. of this. We have never seen men in power and we have never seen women in power. So when, when we talk about, I hear a lot of people who are in the sort of woke culture talking about the fact yeah. that men have been in power for so long. And I'm like, okay, what you have seen is men who are completely out of alignment with their own masculinity. You've seen all the shadow expressions of masculinity. Same is true of femininity. And it just so happens that when, when men are out of alignment in terms of their masculine energies, then it turns to things like domination. Yes. It turns to things like tyranny. But when we start thinking that those things are men in power, we've lost our capacity to conceptualize of what a real man is. Oof. So I, I'm needing us to get, wait a minute, wait a minute. Neither gender has ever been in a state of power. They've been completely trapped in the unconscious versions of those energies. That's the first thing. Second thing is there is, there is a beneficial movement when you're stuck in these shadow energies of self to disidentify, meaning we step out of it. And this is part of what you're watching in 
we could say what's healthy in this development within humanity out of gender identity where we're, we're essentially saying, wait a minute, being that does not necessarily quote unquote define who I am. I have the capacity to not simply act like my gender. I don't wanna be judged according to just my gender. And those things are, are, we could say positive manifestations of this whole LBGTQRS, you know, <laughs> movement that's acting right now. However, we have got to be very careful about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. And what's really bothering me is that is what is happening. We're essentially, we're taking a person who's totally not integrated. Like no man I really have shaken hands with is totally integrated. Same with, with a female, with their gender, right? And we're essentially saying, well, just disown it and never really have a healthy relationship with it. And I don't agree with this at all. Um, men have to do the opposite of what we're teaching today. They don't need to embrace their feminine sides. They don't. What they need to do is to come powerfully into these conscious expressions of masculine energy. We are in an absolute crisis of starvation for these energies on earth. And the same goes for femininity. What we're needing to see is a rising of the conscious power of both genders. This means that women have got to powerfully own their femininity. Men have got to powerfully own their masculinity. And what you'll watch is a balancing of energies because ultimately we're just looking at a polarity, right? I could, this is what gets this whole thing complicated. I could literally look at anything in existence and I could sort it into male or female because masculine and feminine represents polarities, right? Yes. Light, masculine, dark, feminine, receptive, feminine, penetrative, masculine. Yeah, exactly. We could do this with everything. We could do it with everything. And, and actually we, we do to some extent. Even more so when you speak certain languages, even though they're right. wrong about it, they're wrong about right. a lot of them. But um, all this being said, <laughs> there are so many absolutely wonderful things that get disowned when we disown the masculine. And so many wonderful things that get disowned when we disown the feminine. And we are living in a society right now, which is not conducive to both. I can tell you that. I mean, we're, it's like, it's like, it's like all kinds of messed up, you know, <laughs> because at the, at the same time as you have a society that was made for men by men, and therefore is not conducive to feminine health, women have reacted to that in a way to sort of fight against it. And in that fighting against it have turned against their own sons, thus raising this entire culture of men who are feeling like their own masculinity is the enemy. And then they lose it. And then, so right now, I mean, really we're in a crisis right now. So if a lot of people are feeling like, I just don't know what to do about this whole, like, what do I do with my manhood? What do I do with my womanhood? You should feel that way to feel any other ways to not be in reality, honestly. Yeah. And at the same time, as I'm, I'm saying this, we have to also understand that even if we step away from this gender conversation, over the course of history, we have stepped progressively farther and farther away from what health for our species looks like. Now, biological, biologically speaking, what's good for a man and what's good for a woman is going to fall in alignment with what's good for us as a species. But what's good for us as a species is group living. And what you're watching is people just continue to step further and further and further and further away from that. So they're like, there's an, a complete absence of resources, which includes, but is definitely not limited to, young children never being educated into what it means to embrace these energies within themselves. The fact that we have young men, I could say the same thing for young women, we're having a conversation with you today, the fact that we're living in a society where you have young men who have absolutely no track of mentorship for embracing their own masculinity, knowing what that means, and then bringing these energies to contribute to society is a travesty beyond measure. Because if we don't have that, they can't dissociate from these energies. They will slip into the shadow energies. Yes. So we've got to get these energies are going to express themselves one way or the other. We don't get to avoid that. Do you want to, do you want to consciously direct it or do you just want to watch what happens when you don't? All right. So let's say that, let's say men, right? Let's say there are these amazing traits that come along with masculinity, things like initiation, things like protection, things like action, things like positive ownership, things like generosity, things like encouragement, mm. 
encouragement being the primary way that that males express love in the world things like mm. intellect things like direction things like physicality right for men really stepping into their power in the world today looks like how do i find little practical ways in my life to express these energies through me so so if so if it's the physical how do i become more physical how do i get more in the physical how do i pump more energy through the physical that's you know quite simple you can do that through lifestyle choices you can do that through exercise i mean all kinds of things right um action as a man there's almost nothing worse than being passive for the masculine energies yes right so so then as a man i'm asking myself how can i be more active on a daily basis and how can i hold and then how can i as a man hold the other men in my life accountable to that and this is the this is the gold right here because this is i'd say more than anything you've mentioned this far this is the piece that's really missing is accountability oh yeah Oh yeah. And, and you know how, like one of the most important things for women is to gather, right. And to gather and share is something that is uniquely feminine and has contributed to a lot of progression within society over the course of, of thousands of years. But for men, it's really holding each other accountable is this thing that is so innate to men. And it, it, it's interesting on a, on a non-physical level when men are holding each other accountable and really pulling each other in and like mentoring each other into it, into positive action, it creates this kind of a, a stronghold or a web around society. Yes. yes. So yeah, we're needing to bring that back in a very real way. Now, when it comes to women, you've got these amazing qualities like openness, qualities like wisdom, qualities like creation, like healing, like uh, receptivity, nurturing insight, and that connectedness. And sharing, like I mentioned before. And we could say that where men are to the physical, women are to the spiritual. So we've got physical, non-physical. And we're we're essentially when we come into this energy and we look for little ways each day to practice these energies, what will happen naturally is that there's a rise of power in both gender polarities. And that rise of power goes like this. It fits together mm. perfectly. And what does that look like? practically. You know, I have a vision of families leading communities of, um, of, of both men and women, women sharing the burden because leadership is a, it's a beautiful burden. Um, and so, yeah, but what does it, what does it look like in, for you? What does that look like practically and tangibly? Well, it's going to, leadership is going to look different between men and women because we may be using the same word, but if you, if you look at it again on the sort of non-physical level, just at the energies, masculine leadership looks like follow me and feminine leadership looks like come to me. Hmm. You know, the masculine is, is the, is the, the mountain is the pyramid. Yeah. Yeah. Is the and it's the penetrating force, and the feminine is that openness, the inverted triangle. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love that what you're saying, like uh, the follow me versus come to me. Yeah, it's very it's yeah, it's very it's a very different energy, and like something that I think that we get lost in often, especially when we're focused on the physical, is not understanding the same action can be taken from totally different energies. Yeah. So a, a woman may be sharing her information and it very much resonates at this frequency of deep wisdom. A man may be sharing, you know, his insights and it resonates at the frequency of this sort of logical intellect. So, a lot, so this is why it, when, you know, I sort of struggle to say it's going to look so incredibly different. You know, I mean, society will look so incredibly different when, when this whole thing happens, but it's not that there, it's not that women and men are going to like on the physical be doing completely opposite things. Right. It's that they will be coming at these, the same things from a completely different place. And because of this, you know, the thing that they are doing is going to feel more whole. It's going to feel more rounded. And but, more, you know, that being said, the, the, oh yeah, much more. There's also, there is going to be, you know, obviously there needs to be some changes to the way that society structured in order to, create that type of a society because females are cyclical 
and our society is not built to be cyclical. Like there's no, there's no, oh, there's off time for you to go into a winter of your life. And then, oh, now we're going to be on again because we're in the summer of our life. Like women go through a whole entire year every month. They, they probably don't realize that, but they do. Yeah. And to fit into a society that is literally just like, oh, it's just the continual progression doesn't really work for women. So I, I do expect for our society to change the, the, the week, the typical week is going to change. <laughs> mm, I love that. How we show Are up. We're going to bring back the 13 months and the 13 moons. Can we just do that like across the globe? Can we just acknowledge what's actually happening celestially instead of trying to put some kind of a map over it that we're making up? <laughs> you know? I'll sign up for that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, I guess since we're talking about energies, I experience you actually having a lot of masculine energy. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? In in your, in, in, in that pursuit of excellence, I would say. Yes. And, and so there's also an acknowledgement that we, we as individuals, we carry both masculine and feminine. And so yeah. therefore we as a collective have to uh, start becoming, it's not just balance. It's actually harmony becoming more harmonized with the collective masculine and feminine polarity. And so I, I know we're in a state of chaos. Do you believe out of this chaos will come beauty? Will, will come not utopia, but a time that's uh, more in alignment with who we are as human beings on this planet? I couldn't be in my line of work if I didn't believe that that was going to happen still. Yes, yes. Will we see it in our lifetime? No. All right. And it's not about that. I mean, I, to be honest, um, to to strive for that would almost become a bit more narcissistic. Um, the the long term thinking, you know, we're coming out of short term thinking. Hopefully, we're 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 embedded in this short term thinking, but coming into the long term thinking, the seven generations ahead, making decisions from that point. You know, I believe that that will get us there. Where are we? Where are we on this? You know, you know, people say we're going into the golden age. I like to think that we are in the distant past of a great future. Yeah, we are. We're deciding our fate right now as humanity. It's a far darker answer than most people want. Yeah, go there. Bring me some darkness. <laughs> you really want that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, that's what's real. And, and so if, if we're all being invited uh, to simplify, to come in, to, to kind of hunker down and prepare for the storm. Remind yeah. me to come back to the concept once I say what I'm about to say of radical honesty. Or no, radical ownership, sorry. Yes. All right. So here's the reality check, because we've been talking about how important it is to be radically in reality. Human beings over the course of history and increasingly more and more so have been behaving more like a parasite than like a symbiotic creature here on earth. The earth itself has an immune system. All organisms essentially have some version of an immune system. When the earth has an immune system and it's got an organism living within it that is acting like a parasite, its own immune system will act upon it. We're putting ourselves in a very dangerous position whereby through our narcissistic behavior, we are presenting ourselves as a threat to the very system we live in and therefore that very system will turn on us. And we're starting to see that already as if we're not doing a good enough job of turning on each other. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're essentially doing, you know, it wasn't a joke when I said this is the, the pattern that we're in is trying to break out of this narcissism. Our entire survival as a species depends on it. Mm. Yeah. What did I hear recently? I heard recently that like literally we've depleted our own soil because of our, you know, capitalistic food system that we only have uh, enough soil to support 60 more years of food. And uh, people are not waking up to this fast enough. And the, like, that's the, the problem with people is that the amount of pressure you have to put on a person for them to change anything is usually so much pressure that by the time they do, it's already too late. 
Um, so all that being said, I mean, we're like, that's the, the dark side of this. The dark side of this is we are deciding whether or not our species is slated for extinction. Yeah, it's, we are the frog in the boiling water. Yep. And it, it feels that people are just okay to burn up and go belly up in that pot. Yep. However, there's many of us that can feel our legs. Yep. That can feel the bottom, so yep. to speak, of that pot. <laughs> and, and, and so many of us who actually have the power to burn the soles of our feet so we can jump out of this pot of water. And so Teal Swan, I believe that you are one of these leaders who can help to wake up. You know, I know it's, I know it's a trope, but it, it really is a, a waking up type of moment here. And so, oh, yeah. and so, you know, how do we as individuals get in the game and get out of that pot? How do we get there through radical ownership? Radical ownership is how we get there. See, we could, those of us who are waking up to this, who are, who are like, oh, we're, we're really in trouble here. Yeah. We can't awaken and then distance ourselves from others. And this is what I'm watching in the consciousness community. The consciousness community says, well, I'm not like those people. Yeah, the other. Radical ownership is to say, you know what? I came down as part of this human society i came down as part of human consciousness and i'm not separate from it that means i've got to look for every single way that i am doing the very thing that i'm looking out at the world and saying that i dislike at the same time it also means that i have to really ask myself the question do i want to go sit on a hill by myself in my own personal happy bubble or am I going to radically own the other parts of myself, meaning other people? Hopefully this extends beyond that to other aspects of the world. To the degree that I would rather be in it with them. Yes. And, and this calms the system. It, ironically, it's like there, it almost doesn't matter as much whether we survive this or not as a species. What matters is that you cast your conscious vote. Mm. Why does that matter? Well, because the two principles that governed life in a state of awakenedness in a life that's worth living is love and choice. There is no more powerful thing than love and choice. Love being yes. the conscious decision to take the other as a part of the self and therefore not be able to act against its best interests. Choice being, I will become aware and with that awareness of what is going on, I'm going to cast my autonomous vote. And how I do that is with my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I'm wanting people to play such a long game that it's almost like no matter what happens to them in this life, they can die and say, I lived for exactly what I believed in. That's what casting your autonomous vote is. So when I think about, you know, casting my autonomous vote, everybody has to come to this, but my autonomous vote is I have no interest in sitting in a happy bubble made for one. I've decided that all people belong to me and as such, I'm going to be in it with them, even if that runs us straight to the end. Yeah. And in that decision, there's a sense of connectedness and a sense of purpose that cannot be found elsewhere. You know, that, coming from you that that brings up the the archetype of the great mother mm -hmm. and there's a bit of uh sacrifice through that archetype and that willingness to see all humans as as your brothers and sisters but as your children you know we're all children of of the of the great mother and so that that willingness to uh devote ourselves back to her. And I, I love that you said the earth has an immune system and also has consciousness. Yeah. Our consciousness comes from earth consciousness. We are earthlings. I'll speak for myself. I am an earthling, <laughs> you know? And so, <laughs> oh man, I, I, I just, I, I guess what I wanted to say here is um, what, what are some tools? What are some ways the average person can tap back into the earth's consciousness, can give our energy back to earth's consciousness versus the taking. Well, attunement to it is, is like a very important part. 
attunement to the earth really starts with going and being out in it. You know, we are, we're so lost in our cities that we have lost touch with nature and I'm, that's not a healthy state for any human being. So my first hope would be that people would go spend some time in nature. And I mean, time where they're putting their cell phone down, they're taking their shoes off, you know, they're really, they're really connecting with, and connection doesn't mean you have to communicate with something. They're really connecting with the things around them that yeah. we would assign to nature <laughs> over in that category. Oh man. Yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing is we need to ask ourselves when we're interacting with anything other than us, is this in alignment with its best interest or is this against if I was in that position, how would I feel? Mm. We can go back to that very simple teaching. We can make a revival of that original Christian teaching yeah. due to thy neighbor, right? But that includes a plant. That includes, that includes an animal. That includes the way we're treating oceans. That includes our choice to take public transportation. You know? Yeah. It's interesting because we're, we're also in this kind of tug of war because even as we come into connection with that consciousness. Even when I, you know, nowadays I see a spider, I put him in a little piece of paper in a jar, take him outside. And I have a little conversation with that spider. And then I start to wonder what did that spider have? What message did that spider have for me? Yep. I mean, this is like, this is better than scrolling on Instagram, like to oh, go yeah. in and actually, to actually ponder these things. And at the same time, then I get in my truck and I go burn fossil fuels to get to wherever I'm going. And it's like this tug of war. It's, it's sometimes it's like, wow, I'm really dancing in it. However, I'm still in this reality. I'm still in this square world. You know, you defined like we're supposed to, we not supposed to, but we are, we're, we're on a ball floating through space. We are in a cyclical world uh, with a square boundary put on us. And so there's this, there's this like, there's something has got to give in this tug of war. Oh, totally. Well, th well, this is why what I'm encouraging people to live with is this concept of reduction of suffering. Your commitment should be to reduce suffering because yes, yes. honestly, you know, to say I'm not going to ever cause suffering to any, you just can't live a, a human life in society doing that right now. So truly. So if the commitment is to reduce suffering and, and that's everybody's commitment, and that should be the commitment of companies and corporations running our world as well. Yes. Then the decision on the behalf of these companies to purely keep things the way they are, even if it doesn't benefit the, you know, any other aspect of the system for the sake of financial gain, that mentality is going to go away and you're going to see technologies that are no longer, you know, causing the kind of damage as the stuff you're using today come into play. Yeah. And this is part of breaking out of the narcissistic cycle. Do you have any idea how much further along our technology is than people think? It's being suppressed. It's being suppressed in favor of, you know, the tycoons making money for themselves, not thinking beyond themselves and often just their children. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the, this is why I'm focusing my energy on changing the way that people think. Because if you change the way people think, you change the way corporations are run. You cannot, you can, we love to come in and think we can impose all these rules. Like that's one level of dealing with things, but like we can impose all these rules that then companies will have to follow. And I'm like, you know, it's a very poor substitute for changing somebody's mind to the degree that when they then get into business, they open a company that actually benefits society instead of creates, you know, some sort of, a, you know, the shadow, shadow aspect of of capitalism dynamic where they're screwing the very people upon whom their business depends. Yeah. And in, in that as well, the, the entire financial system is ready for an overhaul as well. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any insight to that? I mean, you know, I know so many people who've lost a lot of money in the last few years, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's through their investments, their 401k IRA or Bitcoin or crypto, whatever it is, you know, these the game is rigged as they say and that and that shadow has come into the light and so you know how does how does the financial system um play into this and i just wanted to throw my two cents in saying that i love that you're calling us back into community and connection this is mm -hmm. a core tenet of of what sacred sons is doing is bringing us back into contact with each other 
Um, and I, it's not that I have an illusion of going to some bartering system um, because I think we're a bit too big for that. But is there an overhaul coming economically? We're not just too big, but that didn't work for a reason. If bartering works, then finances wouldn't have been invented in the first place. The problem we got into with bartering is what happens when this is what I have to give you and you don't want it. Now I'm actually stuck. So finances is something which was invented a long time ago to get us unstuck. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're just like looking at doing the same baby with the bathwater thing, if we're looking at money and just throwing it out the window, we don't understand that original intention, which made it yes. so beautiful to us. Yes. So it's almost like with finances too, we've now seen the shadow of, of the financial system. How, how do we weed out the shadow of the financial system, but keep what's truly beautiful about the, about the financial system, about money? And I don't have that answer for you straight off the bat, but I believe, I believe while I'm tinkering on the, around the world and listening to different opinions and going out of body, I have to believe that in my lifetime, I'm going to meet with somebody who has a better idea than I do about what, what the future of finances will look like in alignment finances. Yeah. Uh, Charles Eisenstein wrote a book, Sacred Economics, which is a pretty good shot at it uh, by my estimation. Um, and that's what, that's the other thing I love about community is that it really takes all of us, all hands on deck. We all have gifts uh, to share in this lifetime to, to, to raise us all up. And that's, this is also one of the plights of the egocentric or narcissist perspective. Like, oh, I got to figure it all out myself. Yeah. But in fact, you have allies and we're here. And so yeah. like tapping into these communities that yeah. really bring out and inspire your gifts, not to suppress yeah. your gifts, but to include your gifts. Totally. And so, yeah, what's, what's been your experience in community? You've helped tens of thousands of people with your work. And the ripples beyond that are immeasurable, truly, mm -hmm. that ripple of impact. So thank you for your work. Um, but how, what's been your, your personal experience with community? And, you know, you have an excellent team around you, uh, you know, but what are, what are some of the pieces of community that, that feel aligned for you? First and foremost, when you've got this absolute dedication to excellence and mastery, there is no way for you to achieve a state of excellence and mastery in a closed bubble of made for one. True. You know, you have to be able to truly succeed, which is my aim here. You honestly have to be in reality enough to understand when somebody has more power than you and when somebody is better at something than you. And then it is an absolute waste of time to try to get to their level and let, instead of just bring them in and be like, Oh, thank God, let's figure out a beneficial arrangement so that you can do that thing. I suck at, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what, when it's working properly, it's just, it's like an, how an engine should be where it's like, you've got the carburetor that knows exactly how to be a carburetor. It loves being a carburetor. And by virtue of being a carburetor, it adds to this overall well being of the engine, you know? Yes. And same goes for all these other parts. And, and when it works, it really works and everything goes forward very fast. And yeah. And I, I mean, there's an element too. there's so many elements. I mean, I could be here just having an entire conversation with you for like five hours just about this. But one of my favorite things about community is just this feeling of doing life together. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason that we want partners. We want partners because we want someone to witness our life with us. We don't want to have to tell everyone a story about what happened. We want to be able to be like, oh my God, that was amazing, right? Yes, yes. And I, it's like, it's, it creates this nostalgia too. Cause it's like, you've been with these, I've been with a lot of these people for like, you know, over eight years, nine years on my team. And my memories are their memories. Yeah. And now it's like a collective nostalgia. And, the, and it gets to the point where when you practice working with each other and conflict resolution, to a certain degree, you, you just work like a well-oiled machine. So there, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really take a lot to create harmony. Yeah. I, I love what you're saying. It's the nostalgia and also the having something to look forward to pieces. You yeah. know, I was just with my, my father for the weekend for this past weekend and, and uh, my brother and his family. And it's the first time we got together in a couple of years. And so it was, it was really interesting to hear my dad's memories of me and of my brother and of our family, because he has memories that I forgot. I had 
I couldn't have conjured up until he said it. And that collective memory that we, um, that we can weave together, that web that we can build. Uh, and then with, when you said the word encouragement, like my dad in his, you know, he's in his elder years now, um, his encouragement of others is so powerful. His generosity is so powerful. And he wasn't always like that in his life, but I, I, I can feel that coming through in that, in that sort of um, sovereign kingship, let's say the joyful king. Yeah. And, and even, and just like him reminding me of things of my youth uh, that like that had, that had, that had just slipped my mind. I love, I love that part about the nostalgia and having things to look forward to. You've mm-hmm. spoken on this. I have spoken on this previously. I think it's good medicine. Yeah, Simply that. And, I, and the reason I brought up my dad is because before that trip, I'm just sharing personal stuff with you. If you're open. I love that. You know, was, I love that. He was saying to me, like, oh, it'd be good to get together one last time. Like, that's how he was speaking. And, and even on the trip, he gave me he gave me this watch. He gave my brother a watch that he had. And I've seen these watches for my whole life. He's always had them in his closet. And he gave them to us. And, and our response was like, thank you, but it's not the end. You know what I'm saying? Like, and by the end of the trip, he was saying like, oh, so when are we going to do the next one? This was great. You know, but the beginning he was coming in with this a different perspective, a, a little bit of like, this is it. And then by the time we left, we had something to look forward to. So I was wondering if you could speak on this concept of, of the power of having something to look forward to. I love the simplicity of it. Human beings are first and foremost, creative entities. We could look at the human species as a manifestation of what we could call the mind of source, the mind of God. So the capacity to conceptualize in terms of thought of what we want and then use our energies to actualize that thing is an essential part of well-being for a physical human. If it feels like all we're headed towards is nothingness or doom, those energies cannot be awakened within us. If it feels like what we're headed towards is what we want, then you'll notice an awakening of that dormant life force energy, even sexual energy, pouring forth into what you want to make this life into. Yes. And so, I mean, what I watch first and foremost when people are have got something to look forward to is suddenly they've got energy. Yes. And like that can't be understated, especially for right now, because so many people are struggling. We are in a crisis of crisis of energy as well. I mean, people feel so maxed out. It's like, oh God, you know, I I got myself out of bed today, and that's about what I could handle. (laughs) So I'm I'm really wanting, you know, part of looking forward to things and putting things in the future to look forward to, even if they're little, right? It doesn't mean that if if we're in a really bad space mentally that we can even imagine the future is going to be awesome. It's not something I'm requiring people to do. I don't want them to lie to themselves either. But even if we put something in our day that we have control over happening and make it happen that we want to have happen, that starts to restore energy to our system. Yes, it's it's compounding. Yeah, it's essential for our physical health. It's essential for us to feel emotionally okay. It's essential for us to give rise to new thought. And I, I mean, honestly, a life with no energy is no life. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, right now it's really important. It's really yeah. important to consciously decide, you know, to, to like put things there to look forward to. Because we're not, honestly, we're not in a time in society where society's doing a good job being like, look what we have to look forward to, guys. It's like you open anything nowadays it's like oh by the way we're dying soon oh by the way that went to shit oh by the way no. it's like you kind of want to be like all right i get it like we're headed down we're headed for a cliff you know yeah. and, and it's like yeah in a way we're headed for a cliff yeah yeah but if we wake up to that right now i'm not wanting people to wake up and be like oh we're doomed no i'm wanting people to be like oh no humanity's deciding our fate and go like wait a minute what do I want my fate to be? How do I put my thoughts, words, and actions towards that fate that I want on a daily basis? And if I need to zoom in because I'm so overwhelmed right now and make that just about the day that I'm living in, then make it just about the day you're living in. If you need it to zoom in even further, make it about the hour you're living in. Those baby steps. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, those baby steps will very soon expand because the human, one thing that I think people need to be able to rely upon and can is that our species naturally is a, an, is a, an expansion 
obsessed species. You don't have to really work hard on growing. Right. If there's anything about us, if I can say anything about humanity, it's literally like once we get to here, we want to go here. And once we get to here, we want to go here. So even if you have to, for a time, zoom in and be like, well, it's just about the hour I'm living in, or it's just about the day that I'm living in, that's only going to last so long before you're like, what about next month? You know? So you're, you're going to notice this natural expansion happen. And stuckness is not natural to a physical human, which is why we don't thrive in stuckness. Notice? Yeah. You know, you, you connected a couple dots for me right there. And hmm. one is that we can solve the external in energy crisis by fixing the internal energy crisis. That is powerful. <laughs> That's really powerful. Like, like building our human energy, our human capacity will, will result in fixing the energy crisis. Cause like you say, and I, and I have this belief too, I believe men that come through our programs, hopefully they will be those CEOs. Hopefully they will make better decisions, but it's even yeah. beyond that at this point. Yeah. And so, and then the other, the other dot there is that, ah, man, it's in, uh, it's in our command and it's in the command of our attention. We know the, the most precious resources are human attention, kind of, and where, what we give our attention to. Um, so yeah, could you speak to that a little bit? Because I, what I heard in there is that, hey, get in alignment with your standards and give your attention to that. Make everything else kind of uh, peripheral to that focus. What I'm wanting is a, is a one, two step from people. Mm. Step one is awareness. So that's where we, we become aware of what is happening. And that is not often a fun process, right? Yeah. Because part of becoming aware is to recognize what isn't working. But step two is given that, what do I want instead? And once you have defined that, you need to focus your time and your energy and your resources and your action to that thing. So as to bring it about, and unless you are doing that, you're going to feel a complete depletion of energy. And like when, when you're doing that, every step you take towards it gives you more energy to take another step towards it. So, so it's that one, two step that people need to master because right now they're, they're lost in one or the other. Either we're so lost in the awareness of what's going on, most especially when it's not working, that we're like, it's never going to work and we never go to step two. Or we're so lost in step two, which is like, oh, I just, I'm just going to focus on what I want and go there. And it's like, they're missing all the information. And, and this is especially important for men to know because men are, are really, I mean, if, if I was to just to show you like a basic drawing of the way that masculine energy works. It's like an arrow. Mm. An arrow is a pretty dangerous arrow if there's no information taken in, right? Like, let, let's say I got to take, as a man, let, let me say, I got to take in the information about my whole environment, about the people around me to make sure that that arrow isn't pointed at my own child, right? Yeah. Yeah. Versus, versus pointed at, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is that I'm wanting. So we can't be lost in either or. We have to be in both. Taking the information, use that awareness to go in the direction of what I'm wanting powerfully. And, and the reality is, and this is the truth, there are so many arrows pointed at our children and at our children's children right now because they are lacking the information because they are lacking the accountability because they are lacking the aim. Yeah. But that's exactly where those arrows are pointed. The so-called toxicity of, you know, of masculinity, the shadow of masculinity that's in the driver's seat right now uh, for some. Yeah and, we, yeah. and it's sad because we have to be as parents, we have to be in an incredibly creative space to provide our child with the needs that would have been provided by a basic society X amount of you know years ago. Yeah. And, you know, as if that's not bad enough, how do you become super creative with what to do about your kids when your own life is so damn overwhelming? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to acknowledge that, you know, in, in our position as adults, we're definitely in a, a super difficult position, especially with the complexities of our lives to do that. 
and nobody's going to do it perfectly, but the more creative we can get with our kids right now, the better. Yeah. And there's a, there's a reality. I'm witnessing so much generational healing happen with the men that I work with. I know you have, you have had your own kind of generational cycle breaker uh, experience and, and that's, what's needed not to succumb to the same fate as those who came before us, but to choose differently and to exactly. choose love, yep. to choose love. Now this is, yep. this is big medicine for us. It is hugely. Yeah. All right. Last piece I want to ask you about because uh, some of my peripheral attention goes to it is UFOs. Really? I'm okay. wondering. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering if you have any insight on disclosure if you think it's a farce if you think it's just another media control or if do you, do you think there's another uh, conscious being that is in our planet or visits our planet or is in the ocean or any anything like that the answer was we've got both going at the same time there has been an extraterrestrial influence with humans since the beginning of time on this planet yes and a lot of them. It's not like we're dealing with one species. No, we're dealing with tons. Yeah. So we're so that is a reality at the same time as it's a reality that there's incentive to control a narrative around extraterrestrial contact so that you can use it to control human beings. Yeah. Basically more of the same. More of the same, but it's what, it's what we're already looking at, which is how do you weed through all the chaff to figure out what's real when everybody's got a motive for sharing certain information with you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, such fun <laughs> times we're living in. It's amazing. Okay. And so and with, with that, do you have any, do you have any personal um, contact uh, near death experience, any, any kind of like experience that has brought you to like a higher intelligence, uh, Akashic space, or, you know, in, anything like that, where you have been shown, uh, something outside of this particular reality, aside from the dream space, but a bit, a bit every, day. Every, every day, day. Every, every day, yes, every day. Like that's, uh, that's where I spend the majority of my time actually. So yeah, it's not, I mean, maybe it would be good if you clarified your question a little bit more, because it's like that, that state you're describing is sort of like asking, have you ever been, in, I mean, do you ever take showers? Yeah. Or, or do you ever go to sleep to dream? So you are tapping in to a higher intelligence consciousness. Um, okay. So I, what I, I get it. I get it. Okay. So this, this is what you understand. So when I came into this earth, I came in in a very different way than most people did. Mm. I came in actually intending on a disability. I want you to pretend that um, life itself, as you know, it is almost like plugging into a computer game. This is just the best analogy, right? Let's say that we create this learning hologram, almost like an art piece. And then we insert a piece of ourselves into this art piece into this computer game. Now, most of us have essentially the capacity to really plug in, meaning you're here in the physical, you're identified with yourself and you're getting a lot of learning and expansion from that process. I short circuited that process and could never what we call fully phase with the physical. Mm. So even though in the spiritual community, what's happening with me may be considered a gift in the universe, it's considered a chosen disability. That disability means that it's like blended like that for me. So I'm like looking at both. So like, if, if this is all you're seeing, this is what I'm seeing like all the day, all day long. Yeah. The closest you can get to like, to seeing the world, how I have always seen it since I was born is, is by like drowning yourself in, in something that, you know, it contains a lot of DMT yeah. because you know, I'm like sitting here talking to you these non-physical realms are just like constantly all around us. It took me a long time in my life to figure out like, oh, this is how to identify whether you're seeing something in the room everyone else is seeing or whether it's a non-physical being and we need to act normal to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that navigate, the journey of navigating this experience as Teal Swan has kind of been, you know, unfolding for you over a long period of time. 
Oh yeah, so I, I was born this way. Yeah. So it's what it is is I've just I've gotten better at living with one foot in both worlds is what I would say. But it is not easy. You know, a lot of people would assume that oh well because you had all that you had like such an advantage and I'm like well it's an advantage on one side because I sure as hell never lost touch with the story of why life and all that right. Yeah. And I definitely never lost touch with, you know, this bigger picture and non-physical energies and can see things other people can't see. However, there's a whole lot that I lose by being this way. Mm. And, you know, nav- it's not fun to navigate the world with beings who have such a different perspective than that. That in and of itself creates trauma. Mm, yeah. Because like, I can tell you, I mean, you know how disconnected and detached a lot of these non-physical entities are. From their perspective, what you're going through is perfectly wonderful for you. So they may be acting as if something's going right when you are just written on the floor. And then that way, your own spirit guides become an element in your bystander trauma. So what, what it is, is created this extraordinary pain in me between trying to fuse these parallel perceptual realities that occur when we're living an experience that is so far removed from the other. Yeah. That could be its own book in and of itself, but that, that is the answer as to, as to what is going on with me and the question you asked. Yeah. And so this is the other thing I'm, I'm gaining from this conversation is that you transmute your own suffering by relieving the suffering of others. Yes. It can be no other way when you, when you awaken, and I did this many lifetimes ago, when you awaken to the fact that everything in existence is in essence, a part of you, there's no other action to take, but then to alleviate one's own suffering by virtue of assisting the suffering of others. There's no separation between the two. It would be as weird. Like we're an ecosystem by the way, and we're going to be healthier when we start to think of ourselves that way. Yes. But it's not like when your finger gets hurt, you're like, Oh, my gosh, I'm sacrificing myself to help my own finger or, you know, something it's it just, it's like a, it's like a, con- a concept that doesn't exist anymore. Helping the other is re- registers as a helping of the self. Yes. And by virtue of doing that, it's, it's not even like, Oh, my finger hurts. And so I'm healing it. Aren't I an amazing person for healing my own finger? Like <laughs> you know, all the concepts we have around helping the other just vanish when you're at that perspective. <laughs> so. Yeah. Even, even you go to the bookstore, it's all self-help, self-help. It's like, what, have, where's the section about helping others? Mm-hmm. This is, this is what the, that's the big script flip for us as human beings, because, and I believe there's a, there's a greater reason for this, but because it has to be a choice. Even though we are, um, you know, in an ecological system, we are ecological beings uh, in a relationship with the earth itself. There's something that happened to us in our DNA that separated us, you know, in a way from earth consciousness and and gave it to us as a choice to either be in alignment or in contact with that or not. And so, and so now we've been born into a reality uh, of disconnection. Totally. Yeah, but we're choosing to get connected with that teal swan. Is there anything that you would like to leave with the brothers and sisters or fans of yours who may be listening? Yeah, actually. Um, I think what I would like to say is that this concept of, of love and choice and the choice to love is the most powerful thing you can do at this time. And it, it's interesting because love sort of takes you in the direction of taking the other person as a part of oneself and therefore acting in the best interests of others, which is a profoundly connecting act. At the same time as having to choose for what we powerfully want, which is a powerfully autonomous act. To be able to, despite what other people are doing or not doing, think thoughts, speak words, and take actions in the direction of what you vote for no matter what anybody else votes for. These two things are the most important thing you can be focusing on at this time. And it's not something that anyone has mastered. That's why we call it a practice. But that practice is going to greatly improve not only your life, but the prognosis of humanity. That's the kind of leadership I'm talking about, Teal Swan. That's why we love you. (laughs) All right. 
Um, yeah, man, that that resilient leadership that embodied uh, confidence, and also like the I can I can sense from you this the integration of your own shadow. I know it's um, you're still a human being, and I acknowledge you as such. And we need you. We need you right now. So thank you. All thank right. you so much. Yeah. With that, Teal Swan, Adam Jackson, Sacred Sons. We're out, family. Peace.